Welcome to the Tech 23 Impact Circles. It's wonderful to have you all join us for what's sure to be a fascinating conversation around exploring space, the next data frontier. As is custom, I would like to acknowledge first both the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and the Bunwurrung and Woiwurrung Wurundjeri peoples of the Kulin Nation, the traditional custodians of the land where the Slattery's team meets, works and creates. We pay our respects to the elders both past, present and emerging. We also acknowledge that people are attending today from other traditional lands and nations and extend our respects to their custodians, ancestors, elders and future leaders. Always was, always will be Aboriginal land. Hello, Rachel. Hello, Edina, and how lovely it is to be uh, once again on a Tech 23 Impact Circle and what a wonderful topic for today. Um, so looking forward to this conversation. I uh, particularly want to welcome and thank our contributors today, uh, Robert, Adam, Alex, Sarah, Matt, and the wonderful Martin, who's going to be leading today's conversation. Welcome to everyone zooming in. Uh, it's so um, interesting how these circles have helped us to connect in what's been a, a very um, challenging year. So one of the things that Zoom does so well is um, helps us bring together people from wherever they might be. So please say hello uh, in the chat and uh, tell us what your interest or perspective is on this topic um, as we, as we uh, go through this conversation. Tech 23 is all about amplifying the people and the organisations chipping away at the big challenges we face. And uh, tomorrow we will be revealing the 23 uh, young innovative companies um, for 2020. This is the 12th year Tech 23 has, has um, been run and we've been enjoying the opportunity to connect uh, people who are doing great things across lots to different topics. So if you've missed some of the circles, um, they're all, they've all been recorded. Uh, so visit the website to have a look and, uh, and share away. It's great that the more people actually see and hear what uh, some of the uh, organisations in Australia are doing to face uh, the future. None of this could be possible without the support of the Tech 23 sponsors. Uh, Oz Industry, UNSW, Main Sequence with CSIRO, uh, the New South Wales Government, Macquarie University, Addison's, Ansto and Cicada Innovations. I want to thank them all so much. Again, to all of you on the, on the line, a warm welcome. I'm looking forward to uh, eavesdropping on this conversation. And after the Martin and the contributors share, we're going to take some questions and then hopefully we'll have um, the time to uh, discuss a little bit more informally after that. Adina, it's great to be connecting, isn't it? It is indeed, thank you, Rachel. Now just a couple of things, uh, housekeeping items before we kick off. So you would have seen in your reminders and the Zoom chat, there is a link to the Slattery's Community Charter, which is a great read. If you need some guidance on the behavior that's encouraged at the circles. We are using a shared mural board, which will ask you to add your uh, drawings or squiggles or stickies or notes burning questions too as we go so please add whatever you like please also ask any chat uh, questions rather via the chat function in zoom or just put up your hand if you want to ask live now we are recording this presentation so we'll make it available for you post event so you can revisit and share as rachel mentioned we extend our heartfelt gratitude to every one of the circle contributors and all the tech 23 sponsors and supporters for helping today and all the other sessions come into being we want to thank all of you for dialing in as well to join us now, without any further ado, I'd like to welcome Martin to kick things off. Thank you, Martin. Thank you, Adina, and thank you, Rachel, for that awesome introduction. Well, I'm super excited to, to be able to host this session here today with some fantastic panel members. We've got Sarah Pierce from CSIRO Astronomy and Space Science, Adam Gilmore from Gilmore Space Technologies, Alex Grant from Neriota, Rob Curry from Geospatial Intelligence, and Matt Tetlow from Innovor. They are all leaders in their areas. I'd also like to start by thanking them for graciously agreeing to give up their time to have this fireside chat here today with just a few hundred people listening into our private conversation here. So let me start with uh, a couple of words about Main Sequence Ventures to sort of give a bit of context here. So we're an Australian venture capital fund that specialises in deep tech investments. And while we're an independent venture fund, we're also very associated with the CSIRO and allows us to draw upon the scientists and CSIRO for diligence and deal flow. And that's very unique in the venture capital industry. 
We've been going for just over three years now and have made 26 investments. And we invest in themes such as feeding 10 billion people, humanity scale healthcare, exponential machines, but most importantly, space. And that main sequence we've invested in four space companies. We have uh, Mariota, Alex, uh, who are delivering IoT solutions using satellites for their communications network. Gilmore Space, Adam, building rockets to launch small satellites into high Earth orbit and beyond. Florisat, building out crop management solutions using space-based imaging. And Advanced Navigation, who are building out inertial navigation systems for space, aerospace, and transport. So you may ask, you know, our main sequence as a VC investor, why are we interested in space? Well, space is at the core of our modern society. Communication satellites deliver internet and other services to our homes. GPS navigation is used every day in our cars and phones, also delivered by satellites. The weather forecasts that we have and rely on are enabled from space-based imaging satellites. So our society runs on space capabilities. And we're a very, at a very interesting transition point in the space industry. We're moving from a time where space was purely the domain of government initiatives with large aerospace companies to a time where you can now launch a satellite if you're a startup. Actually, if you're so inclined, you could launch your own small satellite for less than the cost of a house in Sydney. Well, maybe that's not saying like houses in Sydney are pretty expensive, but you know, if you wanted to, you could launch you know, your own private satellite. So the private sector is now getting started and becoming a major funder for space initiatives. Now in a local context here in Australia, we had the Australian Space Agency formed just a few years back with a stated government mission to triple the size of the industry and create 20,000 jobs by 2030. So there are lots of favorable tailwinds to further develop and invest in the local space industry. Now, coming back to this webinar, we had titled this session as Space, the Next Data Frontier. And this is really an acknowledgement that nearly all current space activities are centered around data, whether it's, the, whether it's an exploration mission going to Mars or the outer solar system to gather data on the origins of our universe, or a constellation of satellites to monitor the Earth to give us more information on the weather and environment, or the latest move to deliver internet connectivity from space as is being rolled out by companies like SpaceX. So with this background, I'd like to get the panel session started. And um, we've got a couple of questions teed up here and we'll start by sort of asking the panel members and I think we'll see where this conversation will just sort of roll to as we go through this. So I've got a question here. The first one is around what does data in space or data from space mean to you and why? And um, maybe Sarah, would you like to start on that one? Maybe uh, your thoughts on that? Thanks, Martin. Yeah, happy to. Look, when, I, when we talk about space data, there are two kind of things that come to mind for me. Um, so I'm from CSIRO, National Science Agency. And one of the main areas that we use space data from is in our Earth observation work. We have around 80 scientists working in Earth observation across, across CSIRO. And that's critical for the work we're doing, for example, on climate change. And you'll have seen the state of the climate report that came out jointly with BOM recently. Um, the work that we do in agriculture and um, track, tracking sort of crops and land use Australia, ac across Australia and the work that we do monitoring kind of our oceans and the atmospheres. So that kind of space data is just absolutely fundamental to the science that we do across so much of CSIRO. But then the other sort of space data that comes to mind is, is quite different and that's the data that we get from deep space. So CSIRO runs the Canberra Deep Space Communication Complex um, just at, at Tidbin Villa, just outside Canberra, um, on behalf of NASA's Deep Space Network. And that uses its giant dishes to track NASA's um, spacecraft across the solar system. And that's a really a different kind of data. Um, very um, small amounts of data coming a very long way. And so I think those, those are the two kind of extremes that I think about um, data from far distant spacecraft that we track on behalf of NASA. And then the large amounts of data that we're getting in Earth observation and how do we deal with those? How do we make it more accessible and easier for people to use? Thanks, Martin. All right, thanks, Sarah. Maybe um, pass to Rob. I mean, Rob, your business is Earth observation. So I'm sure you're dealing with lots of data. What do, what do you think about um, you know, data in space and from space in your context? 
Yeah, so we're an Earth observation company. So we use the satellites in orbit to actually look at the Earth and collect data about the Earth. I mean, we couldn't do what we do without, without space-based sensors or collectors. And the reason and the benefit of that is that from space, we look at Earth from a different perspective. I mean, the, the wonderful thing about space and satellites is that can we, we can look anywhere in the Earth. I mean, some really good examples is if we're looking for, you know, um, perhaps somebody lost at sea in the middle of the Indian Ocean. It's very hard to fly a plane there. How do we do it? We can do it from space. I mean, if we're looking at Antarctica and we want to monitor the ice flow, we can do it from space. Or coming back to Australia, if we simply want to look at vegetation change on a large area and monitor the landscape, it's very difficult to do that from any other uh, airborne sensor, but we can do that from space. Now, the wonderful thing about space-based sensors is it's just not a picture. It's actually a picture plus more. Embedded within the data is uh, a whole range of other information that we can analyze and we can produce different results like the health of a crop, whether it needs watering or whether it needs nutrients or whether it's declining, um, whether vegetation is increasing or decreasing. I mean, climate change, as Sarah said, uh, from space, it really helps us to actually manage and monitor those environmental aspects. So I think um, when people talk about what is the benefit of space and often people say, well, why are we spending so much money in space? When you look at Earth observation, here are real uh, world benefits for humans on Earth that we can do now from space. So the benefits are there, but I think as you mentioned, Martin, in the beginning, a lot of people don't realize that they're already using space in many facets of their life every single day. So one of the things I like to do is educate people about what benefits they are getting from space and some Earth observation. Great, thanks, Rob. Maybe I'll pass to Alex. I mean, your business, Mariota, doing Internet of Things. Um, you guys are a big user of space data. What are your thoughts on this topic? Yeah, so for us, uh, space is a really good vantage point to put an antenna for telecommunications purposes. And uh, you, 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 may, you may know that here in Australia and around the world, uh, actually, it's only a small proportion of our geography that's covered by networks like the cellular network. Here in Australia, it's actually only about 30% of our land mass. Uh, and in fact, if we start looking at ocean areas uh, across the entire globe, uh, only about 10% of the Earth's surface is served by uh, cellular communications networks. And that's because uh, the antennas for those networks are not very tall. They may be tens of meters uh, and they provide uh, data communication coverage only close to those antennas. Uh, they simply can't see far enough. Uh, and with space, you can put an antenna five or 600 kilometres um, up into orbit from where you can see uh, all of Australia at once uh, and be able to provide that telecommunications coverage globally. Uh, and that's really important because a lot of um, economic activity and industries operate in areas that are outside of those networks that we might be used to when we're uh, living and working in the city. Uh, so for us, that's uh, a really key part of our infrastructure to really democratize access to data. And in our case, the internet of things globally. All right, thanks Alex. Um, I might move us on to the next question and I'll, I'll throw it to Matt and Adam in a second. Um, so we've heard about how people are using data and how critical data is to the way our society operates, but obviously, you know, we've got to get those satellites up there. We've got to build those satellites. And so, you know, we're just starting to see the real emergence of the Australian local space sector around some of those capabilities. So uh, maybe I'll throw to Matt. Um, what do you think are some of the unique capabilities that we have in the Australian space sector? And, and um, do we have any global advantages here? Yeah, I, I think we do. I mean, I think there's... Uh... There's there's a lot of there's a lot of technology being developed in 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 the uh, the satellite and and launch field launch vehicle area in in Australia, and I think it's uh, the, the tech is is world class and stands on its own, um, but we also have a very um, I guess supportive uh, regime government wise and 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 community wise to basically grow grow the technology or grow the sector to become kind of an important part of of what Australia does, so I think um, you know. We're in a very, a very good position from a technology point of view and from a, a support point of view to make this technology to make this grow into a significant industry. And I think um, also, I mean, kind of 
sort of putting a, a positive spin on, on what may be perceived as a downside, but we also don't have a lot of inertia going in a particular direction. So, you know, if, if we had this huge legacy system that, um, you know, we, we, were, we were dragging along and we'd been developing it for 50 years, then to try and change tech as this industry is kind of changing would be a lot more difficult. So I think we have, um, you know, a, an advantage here that we have a kind of a clean slate and we can say, well, what's the best way to position us from now going forward? We don't have, you know, umpteen million dollars of, of legacy hardware that we have to maintain or facilities and that kind of thing, which of course has its downsides as well in that we don't have a lot of the things that we need, but um, it also means that we can kind of go forward in a, in a uh, I guess, a, a much um, more uh, desired or, or kind of programmed um, manner, I think. Cool. Maybe Adam, um, following on on what Matt just said, what do you think are some things that might be unique about the Australian space sector or our capabilities from your perspective? All right, I mean, I put it, I put a similar spin on it. I think the industry in general is at a stage globally where there's no clear competition. And therefore, if you're, if you're an innovator, if you're an entrepreneur, if you've got good ideas, if you're coming from good uh, university research, you know, you're on a level playing field. And, you know, Australia definitely punches above its weight on research. You know, we're a very entrepreneurial uh, bunch of people as well. And what I like about being in the industry right now is we're not really taking on any global giants, you know, that will smother us with, with, with products. And I think that's a fantastic environment for us to operate in. And, you know, if you've got a good idea, if you've got a good technology, if you've got a good way of making something or doing something, which we have, then you can succeed and succeed globally. So I think, um, you know, we're in a really good environment to, to succeed. Is there anything unique about Australia that would help us succeed? Your, your business, you guys are building rockets, right? To launch small satellites into orbit and beyond. Are there any physical things in Australia here that help us compared to other countries in the world? Oh, well, I mean, we've got good places to launch rockets from. Um, you know, there's places in uh, Queensland that are really good to do equatorial orbits, uh, places in South Australia that are fantastic to do polar and sun synchronous orbits. I, you know, Australia's got a lot of seaway between us and the next country. You know, there's thousands of kilometres east, there's thousands of kilometres south, and that makes launches very, very safe. As, you know, so as a, a natural advantage, definitely launching from Australia is great. Cool. So, um, you know, the government vision that's out there and been and helping the Australian Space Agency helping promote this is around tripling the size of the Australian space sector by 2030. And right now, I think what we're seeing is there are a lot of smallish companies, startups doing interesting stuff. Um, but I think it sort of feels a little bit like, um, I think you said it earlier, was it you, I think Adam said around, we need something sort of big to pull people together as some sort of bigger initiative. Um, I'd like to throw it open to the panel. I mean, what do you think um, really needs to happen to sort of triple the size of the Australian space industry? How, how do you think that's going to happen? Well, can I, can I jump in on that? I, I just came off a government talk about how to do that as well. Um, and I think where we're coming to is, you know, the Australian government from both the defence side and the civilian side already spends a lot of money on space and a lot of money on space data. And it's billions of dollars. So I think one of the things that we can do as a community is come up with some missions in the five and 10 year time frame where Australian providers build the rockets, build the satellites, build the sensors and launch from Australia. And I think that's what's going to come out of the government. And I think that is what will definitely help attaining the goals of the space agency. Um, you know, I think some of the other goals we talked about was um, how do we get unicorns in, in, in Australia in space? And one of the 10 year goals should be that we have three or four unicorns in space. And that, you know, you become a unicorn from a whole lot of different reasons, but one of them is to get government business and to get government research and development. So I think these are some of the critical things for us to get 20,000 new jobs and um, triple the size of the economy. I definitely think it's doable and we're on the right path. Yeah, I'd like to jump. jump. You, you go, Sarah. 
<laughs> now, well, I was just I was just going to agree with Adam um, on the importance, I think, of of missions in order to uh, sort of bring together the community towards a specific goal and, um, you know, and provide funding for for industry to grow. One of the missions that we're working on at the moment with the Smart Stat CRC is called AquaWatch. And the idea is that it will put up a couple of satellites and a whole range of ground based sensors to monitor um, water quality across Australia. And so I think we've got a dual win here, right, um, in this kind of mission, because AquaWatch will deliver something that is absolutely critical for Australia as we manage our water quality and, and deal with climate change over the next decades. But it will also help the Australian space industry to grow. And so it's great from both aspects. So I think we've got, you know, we've got great opportunities here to do that sort of work. So Sarah, you mentioned Australia, and I'll go to Matt in a second. Um, monitoring. What about for the world? Why, why should we not set our sights higher and do it globally as well? Well, it's interesting because for AquaWatch, we, we looked at what needs Australia had, uh, of course, to start with. But since we've started um, planning this mission, we've had a, a whole range of other space agencies contact us, European Space Agency, the Canadians, the Americans are also interested. And so I think we'll find that, you know, if we try and address some of Australia's main problems, those are in fact, in many cases, global problems and that those will be export opportunities too. Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll jump in there. I mean, I think on, on the export side, it's really important that the Australian government is buying things that we hope to export. If you go and try and say, well, we, we want to export this to country X and they say, oh, are you buying it in Australia? And the answer is no, well, it makes it a lot more difficult proposition. So mm -hmm. I really think government needs to, you know, get, get in and obviously echo what Adam said, what everybody's saying is basically if you buy local, you support the local growth of technology. That's how we get to an export situation. Mm -hmm. I think there's certainly a bit of a groundswell supporting that at the moment. Obviously, with um, the COVID situation this year, we've seen a lot of stress on international supply chains, and there's definitely a lot more, uh, th I think, thinking about you know sovereign supply of, of critical capability. And I think space is one of those critical capabilities that we need access to from both launch, satellites, data, all of those things. So I think if one thing I suppose that's positive out of COVID, it's made people really think about what we can do as a nation and what's important for us. So that, I think that's a definitely a positive. Any other panel members on, on this? On this well, topic? I was going to chime in. Look, I agree with all the comments that have been said so far and, and just reiterate that, um, you know, we, we have a, a really quite a, um, a healthy Australian industry in space, Australian um, industry, and, and we, we need to, you know, support that. And uh, we're all here because we're um, uh, successful over many years. And so it's not like it's a risk um, for Australia to actually buy Australian. But I, I certainly think this whole attitude of buying Australian first is really quite crucial to grow this industrial base, which will then allow us to export. And um, I think if you just look at the capabilities that we have, um, people generally will be quite impressed. And so I'm all for pushing, you know, buy Australia first. Mm -hmm. Right. All right. Well, maybe um, switching gears for a bit and let's go a little bit geeky for a second um, and ask each of you um, in your areas, uh, what's the coolest space thing that you've done in your company organization that you maybe want to share with the audience? Something that, um, you know, might be a bit unique or, or different. So um, who'd like to go first if you've been thinking about this one? I'll, I'll jump in if you like. Okay. Um, so, I mean, I think, uh, you know, I mean, I guess it's fairly standard. There are a number of organizations around the world who kind of build satellites out of, you know, parts off the shelf, you know, plug in, you know, COTS part from Europe and then one from the US and, and that's so forth. And you basically stack them together and make your spacecraft. I think there are, there are only a few companies sort of like us who've decided that, you know, you want to build, build all the subsystems yourself and basically own it so you have complete control over it. So I think, and the thing is, if you have complete control of it, you can sort of make it do exactly what you want and some pretty cool things come out of it. So I think, you know, we, we've, the, the, the tech that we've built, um, in, which we're going to, you know, put into Cyrosat and the, the, the four spacecraft that we're building at the moment, 
um, is really kind of completely homegrown and 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 home manufactured, and I think that's that's like a it's a it's a great thing for our team to to have achieved, and I'm yeah I'm pretty proud of having done that. Okay, cool. That's really interesting. So homegrown satellite um, uh, construction capability and technology. That's awesome, Matt. Um, who else would like to have a go to Sarah? You must have so many cool yeah. things happening in research there inside the CSIRO that you could share something with. Yeah. Look. There's a lot of cool things, but if I'm honest, if you say what's the coolest thing CSRO has ever done in space, I need to go back quite a long way. So, so it's 50 years since um, since Apollo 11 and those um, that moonwalk that Neil Armstrong took, and the Parkes Telescope, as many people will know, which is CSRO um, built and run telescope, um, was one of two antennas in Australia which downloaded um, the data from that from that moonwalk, from that very first moonwalk and transmitted it across the world. Um, it was 50 years last year and I was at Parks for the celebration of that 50 years. And it was astonishing to me how inspiring that story still is now, even to kind of young, young students and young people. And I think that's, um, you know, a great aspect of Australia kind of growing its profile in the space sector is the inspiration that we can give to young people to, to get into STEM or even if they don't to get into STEM to understand kind of what STEM subjects can do for them for them and um, and why we support those kind of activities. Of course with Canberra Deep Space Communication Complex and with Parks we're still tracking um, all sorts of spacecraft CDSCC tracks more than 30 spacecraft um, at the moment, including many of the highlights that you'll have seen over the last 10 years, New Horizons flyby of Pluto, seven minutes of terror when Curiosity fell on, on, onto Mars, um, Cassini's last drop into, um, into Saturn. I, so those are really exciting things for me, but they also illustrate how Australia can play a really important role, even in these very large international space kind of activities, if we you know, carefully pick the niche that we can contribute that other people can't do. Some of those exciting things are very topical. Obviously, in the last couple of days, we had the Japanese Hayabusa 2 space probe come and land here in Australia. That was an amazing mission where the Japanese Space Agency um, put out a mission to go to an asteroid, gather some material, bring it back to Earth and study that material to try and understand some of the origins of the solar system and some real fundamental science that uh, uh, is happening there. I was, I was super excited to see it got like uh, main news coverage and you know, the video from all that. So that's another one of those inspiring things. I think that's happening here and hopefully gets more people interested in the space industry in general. And I think the other cool thing is, is the collaboration right between Australia and Japan. And that's part of um, some of the mission from the space agency to enable these collaboration pathways. And uh, that's super important. Alex, what about from your side? Any, any sort of things that you'd Sort of cool thing you'd like to highlight from um, what your company's been doing? Yeah, I think I think one of the cool aspects um, uh, within our company is seeing mathematics go from someone's brain onto the page, uh, then be coded in software, and then be implemented into devices or onto the spacecraft that then makes stuff work. Uh, and for that to happen quite quickly, so literally a, a company and a service that's built on a foundation of uh, mathematics research um, you know that's you know has its um, heritage back um, within the r d sector and, and out of the university uh, that's really uh, satisfying um, and impressive to see that's kind of part a of the answer part b um, was the time when we got a selfie from a farmer on holiday pre-covid in bali holding a beer with his feet up with a photo of kind of a sunset, uh, sending us a, a text with this photo saying, uh, thanks, to, thanks to you guys, uh, I can relax on a holiday because I know that my livestock are getting the water that they need because I know there's water in a water tank thanks to your uh, ability to monitor that. Um, so that's kind of the, the human aspect in terms of some of the applications where um, sort of bringing it down to ground, um, seeing seeing making a meaningful difference in people's life, which is really what we're about uh, as a company. That's pretty pretty amazing. What about you, Rob? From your thoughts? 
Yeah, I, I was, there's so many things, you know, whether it's looking for koala habitat uh, after fires or uh, finding cattle in the Northern Territory, there's just so many things that come to mind. But one one that really sticks out um, is we, we were asked, uh, I mean, I see us as a solutions company. So people come to us and they have a problem and it's a spatial problem. Um, and we use space to solve those problems. Uh, a couple of years ago, a government came to us and said, look, we've lost a, a ship in the Southern Ocean uh, close to Antarctica. We've lost all contact with it. The last contact we had uh, was that it was getting crushed by uh, an ice flow. Can you find it? We need to get the supplies to it. And you go, oh my goodness, you know, this is, um, this is human lives here that we need to look for. It's Antarctica, so it's a, a very dangerous space. Um, and they're getting, we need to find it to get you know, supplies to it. So we use radar satellites and satellite AIS to look at its old tracks and then radar satellites to find this vessel. And we found this vessel where they then um, managed to, it was trapped in ice and had lost all its power. They managed to actually fly a plane down there and drop it to a generator on the ice. And, and uh, eventually they got an ice breaker down there to, to release it. So I think um, as Alex touched on, you know, where, where space can actually contribute to human everyday activities to me is one of the most rewarding things. And, and it was very rewarding to know that we contributed there to possibly saving some lives. So I think that probably stands out but there's many, many other examples. Okay, that's, that's fantastic. That's a really awesome human story there, Rob. Um, Adam, what about from your perspective? Yeah, mine's not as noble as Rob, um, <laughs> but in terms of geeky cool, we all love rocket engine tests in the company. So the bigger they are, the better. So probably my favorite ones is when we've done the main engine tests of our vehicle and you stand about 300 meters away and it just lights up and, you know, the flame goes out about five metres. There's a ton of smoke, a ton of noise. The ground shakes, it hits you in the chest. And, you know, you, you really feel like you're creating magic with that. So, you know, we all love engine tests. Well, they're certainly impressive to watch. Mm. Cool. All right. Um, well, let's move on to a couple other other topics, questions here. Um, I think I actually saw a, a question in the in the Q and A uh, related to one of the things that we're going to talk about here, which is around. I think it's from Michael Vamos. Can see if we're going to triple the size of the um, space industry, what about human capital, um, and how do we address this issue? We actually had a, a question that we were thinking about here at the panel as well. You know, do we have a talent shortage? You know, or a skills gap here if we're going to grow our space industry? Um, can we hire enough people? You know, if we're growing our companies, do we need to import people? Um, what, what do panel members think about that from a talent and skills gap perspective? I'll, I'll jump in first. We just talked about that on my last call as well. I think right now we, we, we have a talent uh, gap for sure. And what the discussion was that how can the bigger space companies partner with universities to co-develop curriculum? Um, and some of the companies have already started doing that. Lockheed Martin and EOS uh, have started a pilot program doing that. We're working with Griffith University to develop content for their different types of engineering uh, classes that will go into avionics, uh, GNC systems, software, etc. So I think that's one of the things that industry can step up a bit to, to take more ownership over what's actually getting taught in universities. I mean, the good thing is, you know, we've been around for five years we employed graduates when we started and they're now fantastic rocket engineers. So I think, you know, the, the talent is good. We just have to focus it a little bit better. Yeah, I, I can maybe offer a, a um, complimentary um, viewpoint um, to what you've said, Adam. Um, in, in our experience, um, it's not so much a lack or a gap in talent, uh, it's, it's the opportunities. Uh, so, you know, every, every time we uh, look to hire, you know, we, we're getting hundreds and hundreds of applicants, and I'm sure you do too, which indicates that there's a lot of really great people coming out of university programs. And I agree, we definitely need to invest into making sure those programs are appropriate to the skills needed as we go forward. Uh, but I, I would say there's a real appetite amongst young people to join space companies. And what we need is more companies and bigger companies. <laughs> Because, um, you know, we're, we're, we're turning away people uh, who would be fantastic employees, um, you know, so where are they going to work? Uh, so it's, it's that old, um, 
adage of um, uh, it, it's the uh, future is kind of here already. It's just not evenly distributed. <laughs> so I would, as, as Mr. Gibson would say to us, yes. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I would agree with, with both Alex and Adam, I think. I, I, we've seen already a number of the universities step up, for example, Swinburne's got their um, space course now that they've launched and were taking students. Um, but I think for a long time in Australia, people assumed that if you wanted to work in the space industry, you needed to leap. Yeah, so people would do their undergraduate degree or their master's or whatever, and then they'd go away to Europe or to the US and work for one of the kind of larger space companies over there. I hope that over time, um, you know, if we do manage to triple the size of the space industry, it will be clear to people that they can, in fact, make a whole career in space here. And we've got, you know, we've got some people on the line who, have course, of course, have managed to do that now. Um, so I think that, for me, is one of the most positive parts of the kind of foundation of the space agency and the growth of the Australian space sector, that all these really bright, brilliant students will be able to make their career in space in Australia. I mean, I think, I think there's a couple of issues. I mean, I agree and disagree with everybody, to be frank, but um, <clears throat> the space sector is massive, you know, and I think we probably didn't touch on this, or you did touch on it, Martin, in the beginning, in that it's everything from, you know, health, all the way to platforms and technology. And the scope for employment is just gigantic. And so I, I think part of the problem is the community needs to know that, that if you wanna get involved in a space, um, you can build rockets, you can build satellites, you can do earth observation, but you can do more. You know, It can be materials, it can be food, it can be agriculture, it can be a whole range of things, and that can all be space related. So I think there's tremendous opportunities, but I think it is there is an unbalance. I mean, I think currently, I mean, I have uh, many people wanting to apply to work for us, uh, but we still need the work to be able to employ them. A lot of people don't realise that the industry is there and the industry is growing. And therefore, you know, with government support, there will be many jobs across that entire sector. I think when we look at government uh, support, it should be uh, spread across a broader range of the space sector to allow those different uh, skill sets and those different people of interest to be able to actually go into those industries. So I think, I think it's a very difficult problem to, to solve. The other thing just on STEM, I mean, we do a lot of work actually at the school level, year 11 and 12. So before they actually go to university and the thing that amazes me, particularly from a geography background is a lot of these um, school curriculums and we've worked in the ACT with school curriculums is, um, people aren't going into science or geography particularly. And yet, to me, um, geography is a fundamental aspect of just about everyday life. And so, you know, working with those school curriculums, I think is very important as well. Thanks, Rob. Um, so, you know, if we want to inspire that younger workforce and new people that are coming up and thinking about space, um, how do we inspire Australians? Um, how do we start inspire Australians to do something wonderful with space? Uh, as a good example, um, you, some of you on the audience may be aware that the United Arab Emirates had no space industry six years ago, and they decided they wanted to do something meaningful. And so they actually started from ground zero and actually put together a, a Mars Explorer. And they've launched uh, a satellite uh, capability now that's going to Mars to do some Mars observations. So they've gone from zero to that within six years. What, what does the panel think about like, <clears throat> I think we touched on it earlier, but what's something inspiring that you know we could really get Australia behind? Adam, I see you nodding. Yeah, I'm nodding. I was waiting for Sarah to jump in. I mean, <laughs> Cairo has very um, nicely had a whole series of um, seminars for the space industry where we all talked about a signature mission. I think that was a great prelude to then what happened with um, the Australian Space Agency at least going out to, to NASA and agreeing on, on participating in a moon Mars mission. Now, what I sincerely hope is we don't lowball the uh, objective. You know, if we do something that's very niche on the side, that's not very impactful, I don't think that's going to inspire people. But I think if we put something on or around the moon that's got Australia in it, that's going to inspire people. So that's what I'm sincerely hoping happens out of the Moon Mars Initiative of the Space Agency. 
Yeah, so I was in I was in Israel last year, and um, you know, you'll know that they tried to send a kind of lander to the moon unsuccessfully, but um, it, it was really interesting as a relatively small um, country with that kind of te technical ambition to do that, and the enthusiasm that they got for the entire population. Um, and in some ways, the fact that it crashed, I mean, it would have been nice if it landed successfully, but space is risky and we have to be um, prepared to, to fail or succeed. But of course, even, even with the crash, it succeeded in its aims of building the technology, the capability and the inspiration. Um, but I would like to also just take a slightly different perspective too. Um, so I personally find moon missions incredibly inspiring and things, but I think we have to realize that not everybody does. Yeah, and I think we fail sometimes to tell the story of how space impacts the earth. Um, and Rob was talking earlier, um, many young people are extremely um, dedicated to, to dealing with the impacts of climate change and things on the environment. And I don't think we successfully tell the story that if you want to help address issues like this, then space is a sector that you can go into because without satellites and without earth observation data, we stand really no chance of being able to deal with any of these, um, of these impacts. So I think there's both aspects. There's the kind of more standard exploration, let's go to the moon kind of aspect, but let's also not forget about the impact of space on earth and how that can inspire people too. I think that's a really interesting point you make, Sarah, because I don't think um, we draw a strong enough connection about, uh, about that, that um, if you are interested in climate change and what's going on, then space actually is a really good area to be working in because you can be at the forefront of us understanding, you know, those changes. And, uh, and it's about the data, as we said, right? Yeah, and I mean, I've got, you know, some young people working with us on Earth observation, making really great national and international impacts into our understanding of the environment and the climate. So it's definitely an area people can go into. Right. Okay. Um, so maybe we should have a, a look at some of the questions on the on the chat here, I think, um, Rachel. We've got a, uh, a couple that have been coming in. Yes. Um, do you want me to try and have a go at a couple or have you got a couple you want well, to... I was wondering whether, yeah, you or any of the contributors, that's a great conversation, by the way, keep listening. Um, but yeah, there's been a few. Um, Nicholas, if you're there, you might want to come on and just talk. I'm not sure how much you've covered around the government. I think Nicholas was asking earlier on about the government spying mechanism. Um, I don't know, Martin, if you want to talk about government and how that works. Yeah, I think we sort of covered that a little bit. I think in the panel where we're talking about in an Australia first type buying attitude, I think that's what's really going to start to help um, get the local industry going. Instead of defaulting to maybe an overseas company, we see if we can find and build that local capability, which is then going to have a self snowballing effect where we build up capability with, and our local companies are more successful for future government contracts. And so, sorry. Yeah. I was I was, yeah. Actually, I was actually going to talk about our collaboration with you, Matt, in answer to that. Yeah. Answer well, then please that. carry on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, because although I know that there are constraints around government procurement, of course, and within CSRO, we live within those constraints. And um, we're working with Innovor now to together build CSRO's first CubeSat. Um, and we took a deliberate decision to procure that from within Australia. Um, you know, we could have gone overseas and bought a kind of more off the shelf sort of CubeSat. But firstly, we wanted the, some of the, um, the capabilities and technologies that Matt's group is able to del deliver. But also we do take very seriously this commentary around government being able to grow the Australian industry. And so, you know, we've had this collaboration for a couple of years now and hopefully it's helped Innovore also, um, you know, gather more customers and build their capability. Yes, I mean, there's, there's, there's no question. It's probably the single most important thing we got was that first customer, right? So, so you know, you, you certainly don't want to underestimate how important it is to get a customer, government customer that's buying your technology. And now we kind of have four missions. So, you know, it's, it's a massive, massive um, thing for us to have, uh, have, have secured, basically. But an, an interesting thing is that, you know, the way government typically engages with with industries via the you know the mechanism of, of primes or big companies 
and the whole buying structure is set up, you know, to buy from large companies. But but um, the, the 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 vast majority of companies in Australia you know, are SMEs or, or, or much smaller. And I was actually on a panel at the, the IAC a couple of years ago, where we we're talking about this this very issue. And it seems that in, in Europe there's a lot of um, uh, a lot of activity around or, or trying to understand how governments can procure what model they can use to buy from smaller companies rather than going after a big prime. I mean, you know, the usual thing is we need to go for a huge company because if something goes wrong, I need a huge stick and they need a very deep pocket so we can, you know, sort of pass the blame to someone else or whatever they want to do with it. And, and that's, that's all good and well, that's kind of how we used to buy, but mm. industry is becoming so many, so much smaller. There's so many smaller companies now. And Australia has, has this massive proportion, more than anywhere in Europe or just about anywhere around the world, a higher number of SMEs relative to larger companies. And yet we still have a very, um, you know, we don't have a good model for how we, how we engage with smaller companies. And there's not even a lot of activity around, you know, working groups and those sorts of things to work out what mechanism could be developed to do that. So I think, um, you know, the, the, the economies are changing and we need to, governments in particular, need to work out how they kind of engage a little bit more with the smaller companies and, and what leverage they can use mm -hmm. in order to, you know, to make sure that they get their um, objectives met and they have their, their various itches scratched and that kind of thing. Yeah, I think that's a really important point, Matt, but I think it's also um, worth pointing out that the role of government, I think, is to sort of act as a little bit of a flywheel to get things going. So, for example, if there's missions like what Syro, uh, the Syro Satellite Mission, that Sarah's talking about, and a few others that, you know, companies like yours start to work with, which is fantastic, that gives you guys flight heritage, flight capability, which then gives other people the confidence to contract with, you know, further, you know, commercial payloads or other types of capability. So I think that's where the role of government's so critical in just getting those things kick-started, the ball starts rolling, it starts to get some momentum, it starts to roll down the hill, and, you know, you can, other companies can take benefit then of that flight heritage capability with confidence that they can then, you know, do further payloads to me on the launch for satellite. I think that's, that's a cool thing that we're got to get to in the industry here. And then, and then it flows on to the export market as well, which is really where, where we have to go as well. So, you know, can't, can't agree more. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, sorry, go ahead, Oh, well, I was, I was echoing someone's um, point before about it's all about the data. Um, so Kim's question was around how um, organisations are sort of complying with um, regulations and and cyber security around data. So does anyone want to take on that question of Kim's, which I think she asked twice. I'm very keen to hear the answer, obviously. Maybe that's one for Rob. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to, uh, to talk to that. I mean, um, cyber is a problem. Anything uh, where there's airways associated, where we're transmitting data through the air, I mean, cyber is always going to be an issue. And it's quite interesting uh, it's a great question from Kim because I've talked to some very senior, you know, uh, people in government and, and uh, I talk about cyber and space and they go, no, 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 that's a separate issue. There's cyber and then there's space. I'm going, no, no, it's exactly the same issue. You know, whether it's your ATM machine or whether it's your telephone or whether it's transferring uh, earth observation data through space, there's a cyber issue. And so I, I think the government gets that now um, but it is a real concern for all of us that, um, you know, that we have to protect whatever that data is that we're transmitting through a, a space vacuum because it is vulnerable to uh, cyber attacks. And, it, and it's very, very valuable, whether it's Earth observation data that, you know, Sarah's discussed, and it could be something as simple as, as looking at our infrastructure in Australia, monitoring infrastructure. It could be railway lines or it could be oil assets or whatever. That is valuable. And so we need to be very cognizant of when we're getting data or receiving data or transmitting data of the whole potential for cyber. But uh, I see the government now as being very proactive in that area. So I'm far more optimistic now than if you asked me this question you know, a couple of years ago. Rob, do you think it's a risk that in Australia we tend to rely on foreign providers for a lot of our space data? Do you think that's something that we need to be focused on thinking about? Well, how much time do we have left? I could talk for a very long time about this. I think for about 15 years now, I mean, I've been in the space sector for about 30 years, but for the last 15 years, I've been talking about sovereign space capability. And, you know, it's used a lot, this whole word sovereignty, but that comes back, it's linked to the cyber issue. It comes back to, 
being independent, it comes back to security of data um, and, and what is really critical. And I think when we look at critical infrastructure, quite often we think, oh, it's telephone lines or it's, it's railway line. Well, no, it's much greater than that. I mean, it can include data. And so I think sovereignty and having our own space, uh, everything from satellites, you know, that uh, Matt could be working on to launch capabilities or that connectivity that Alex provides and, and the stuff that CSIRO gets so heavily involved in is crucial that it's got to be Australian owned and operated for our, for our own protection, to be honest with you. And it's been a long time that many of us in industry have been talking about this, but it looks like we're moving that way now. But to, to get us to that end game, it comes to that, you know, that old question, we need government you know, to support local. And so, um, no, Martin, a very real question, a really a very big concern for a lot of us in the industry that we need to build that sovereign capability. Well, hopefully the, uh, the tailwinds and, of COVID and, and us having our own capability are going to help in that area as people understand why it's important for us to have some of these local capabilities, not always rely on, on international suppliers, but partner, but also have our own you know, capability here. Maybe I might just take it in a slightly different direction for a second. There's a couple of questions up here about, uh, on the chat about space junk. And um, they're a little bit different ones. I think there was one question I saw about you know, does the fact that we, we are geographically in the globe with Australia, does it help us launch satellites that are clear of space junk? Um, and maybe we should talk about what that is, or, do, you know, what are we doing about, you know, thinking about the overpopulation of satellites and space junk around the planet? That's from Janine Cameron here, I can see. So just for everyone in the audience, space junk, what, we, <laughs> what this term is all about is that as we've now been launching thousands of satellites over the last 50, 60 years, there's lots of satellites that are either dead or not operating anymore. There's lots of little bolts and nuts and things that have come off satellites that are all zipping around there at many thousands of kilometers, you know, per second. And they're all collectively known as space junk. We've got this cloud of space junk that's, you know, floating around Australia and uh, around, around the world, I should say. And obviously, as more satellites get launched, there's, there's, um, there's more space junk there, which could compromise, you know, the ability to launch better satellites. So maybe. I'll throw this open to the panel. Maybe Adam, you might have some thoughts on space junk, seeing as you're yeah, a launch company. Yeah, I agree. Space junk is a real problem. Um, you know, one company, SpaceX, wants to launch 40 plus thousand small satellites into low Earth orbit. And they'll do that with a lot of launch vehicles that will leave a lot of their second stage uh, in orbit. Um, you know, they've got propulsive mechanisms on them that are supposed to deorbit them near the end of their life cycle. And that's a trend that we are seeing. You know, there's, there's a lot of talk about space junk, concern about space junk. And then what I'm reasonably happy about is people are looking at what are the practical solutions. So, you know, one of the solutions that we've, that I've heard is people are saying, there seems to be about a 500 kilometer altitude. If you're above that, you stay in space a long time. If you're below that, you burn up reasonably quickly within five or seven years. And so there's a mechanism where people want to say, if you're going above 500 kilometers, you need to be able to bring yourself back down below 500 by the end of your life. And then there's companies that are working on if the satellite communication fails or if it's a second stage that can't have any propulsion left, you go up there and you grab it and you drag it lower and it burns up in the atmosphere. And this is going to become, I think, a big market. Um, and, you know, we're, we're looking at it as well. If we want to take satellites above 500 kilometers, we've got to leave a bit of propulsion, a bit of fuel left in the engines to kind of come back below 500 kilometers. Um, you know, interestingly, if you look at the Virgin Orbit Payload User Guide, they have a big payload drop on their chart at 500 kilometers. And that's because they're leaving some fuel to come back lower again. We may end up doing something similar to that as well. Um, Cause it's definitely a big problem. There's no difference about being in, in Australia. Um, you know, orbits go all over the world. So um, we don't have a benefit of launching from Australia from a space junk point of view, but um, it yeah, definitely something we have to worry about. Although I would, I would say one of the benefits that Australia does have in this area is because we're such a great kind of ground station, we can be really good for tracking space junk. 
or space situational awareness as it's known and that's i think a reasonably fast growing area of the australian mm -hmm. space industry with quite a few people and um, companies having um ambitions in that in that kind of space yeah, this is a, a really important global issue and um on kind of the regulatory side of things, we're already seeing um, regulators like the FCC in the United States move towards um, really requiring um, uh, these kind of deorbit plans uh, as part of the licensing process where, you know, roughly speaking, you're, you won't get the permits you need to operate your satellites unless you have uh, demonstrated that you can be a responsible user of those orbits um, and have a, a kind of a remediation plan for, as Adam was saying, um, deorbiting. Um, so for low Earth orbit, um, that you know around 500 kilometres, that's it takes care of itself. But above that, um, demonstrating um, that you have um, capability on board to clean up. Um, and I, I I think we will see more and more regulators go in that that direction um, and of course in parallel we need the industry as well to adhere to those kind of principles regardless of course alex that requires everyone to play nice together and all countries to play nice and uh, that doesn't always happen uh, i think we've seen in recent years some countries do various tests in space where they've been testing even capabilities to destroy satellites in orbit which has created even more junk in so um I think it'll re remain an interesting area to see if we can sort of get a united sort of effort, I suppose, globally about uh, being responsible about the use of these orbits. Um, just looking at where we're at, we're just about on the hour, Rachel. Should we, I don't know, should we break into the breakout rooms or continue in the main room? Here? Yeah, you I just, you've done a great job leading this wonderful conversation, Martin. So I wanna thank uh, you and the contributors. I think we will stop the formal proceedings and for those that um, can stay on to, to meet and chat a bit more, um, that would be fantastic. Um, you can also uh, continue the conversation via MindHive who we've just partnered with, Tech23 has partnered with. And of course, the recording of this uh, conversation will be made available later for people to share. But for now, follow the prompts. If you get lost, come back to the main room and uh, meet and chat some more about what is just such a wonderful opportunity, Martin, for, for Australia. And thank you to all of you for giving us a bit more of a glimpse on, on what's possible. It's just really inspiring to hear your stories and perspectives. So thank you.